Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our viewers joining us from around the world. My name is Robin Lathra. I am an Education USA Program Officer here at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State in Washington, DC. Before we begin, I would like to pass along a very warm welcome from Education USA Branch Chief, Brooke Spellman, who had originally planned to be with us today, but unfortunately is not able to join us. So a very warm welcome to all of you from Brooke Spellman. In today's interactive episode, we're gonna take a closer look at how US colleges and universities help build community engagement, um, ensure the health and wellness of international students. Over the past year, our colleges and universities in the US have been leading the world in the development of exciting new virtual and hybrid services. You may remember that in our previous episode, we began to explore the topic of virtual learning. Today, we will look beyond the classroom to how US colleges and universities have been adapting and enhancing their virtual and hybrid services to better support student health and wellness and ensure that they provide a safe and welcoming environment for all students to learn and participate in campus life. Student health and wellness is something the US higher education community has been taking seriously for a long time. So today's topic is both timely because of the pandemic and timeless because it is so important. Our goal for the next 60 minutes is to better to equip all of you, our prospective international student audience, with an essential framework to help guide you like a roadmap on your path to US study. After watching today, you will be able to clearly explain why student health and wellness is so important, describe and identify several of the most common health and wellness challenges affecting international students, and explain how, where, and when international students can find the health and wellness support they need. And finally, I wanna make sure that you know about Education USA, our network of more than 430 student advising centers and 550 trained advisors around the world, offering free services to help you plan your education in the United States. After watching today's program, I encourage all of our viewers to continue learning more about today's topic by finding and connecting with the Education USA advisor or advising center nearest you. And as always, don't forget that during this program, our team will be online to answer your questions. So please feel free to post them in the comment box located in the comment section below. Okay, let's get started. Um, first off, I would like to introduce our speakers who collectively have a lot of information to share about international student health and wellness. Joining us from Spokane, Washington is Ken Guan, co-chair of the International Education Knowledge Community at NASPA, the National Association of Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Education. Originally from China, Ken earned his doctorate in higher education from India University, Indiana University in Bloomington in 2017. Since then, he has been focused on helping colleges and universities across the United States enhance their international student services. Welcome, Ken, and thank you for being with us today. Next, I'd like to introduce Sarah Gracious, who is a senior international admissions counselor at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Sarah assists with all aspects of the admissions process, with particular experience working with prospective students in Africa and Latin America. Welcome, Sarah. We are very excited to have you with us today. And last, but certainly not least, uh, joining us today, we have Mohammed al Mekki. Mohammed is an international graduate student from Saudi Arabia, who, like Sarah, is also joining us from Kent State University. Mohammed is currently working towards receiving his Master's of Education in Clinical Mental Health Counseling. Hi, Mohammed. Thank you for joining us today. We are very much looking forward to hearing your perspectives as both an international student and as a future health counseling professional. All right, time to get started with our discussion. One of the most celebrated aspects of the US higher education sector is the fact that all colleges and universities in the US are 100% committed to promoting the health and well being of their students. As events of the past year have shown, the flexibility of the US higher education system has allowed our institutions to lead the world in developing innovative new virtual and hybrid approaches to student health. Despite the pandemic, US colleges and universities have not wavered in their commitment to providing students with the best environments possible to study, learn, and grow. 
The fact that student health and wellness is so clearly a top priority in the United States is precisely why we wanted to explore it in greater detail here with you all today. Ken, I would like to start things off with you. Can you help uh, uh, just to help set the stage for us? From your perspective as someone who works with not just one, but many different colleges and universities, what would you say are some of the most fundamental student health and wellness concepts that every international student should be aware of? And ah, thank you. We've got you, Ken. Yep. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Uh, the very first important fact I would like to mention is the United States is the world's number one study destination for international students. Every year, about one out of five or over one million international students choose to study at colleges and universities in the United States. The reason for this is not coincidence. So many students choose the US because our high, higher education system is simply the best. So what makes it the top choice destination in the whole world? Well, let's take a quick look at some of the main reasons. Um, I'm gonna share and show a few slides. My number one point is about flexibility. The flexibility of US higher education is something I'm sure my fellow speakers are gonna mention. Uh, US colleges and universities are innovative and adaptive to face uh, new challenges. And it provides abundance of opportunities for personal and professional growth. Uh, affordability, so with over 4,000 accredited post-secondary institutions, the United States has a school of, uh, to fit a wide range of student budgets and financial needs. Uh, enhanced affordability, uh, employability. After studying in the US, many people now have agreed that an earned US degree will help you land a good job. Diverse culture. The U.S. college campuses are a perfect example of America's diverse culture. And last but not least, robust student services. The strength of U.S. colleges and universities extend well beyond the classroom, whether it's career advising, mentorship, leadership development, uh, financial literacy, and of course, student health and wellness. When it comes to student support services, the U.S. colleges and universities are simply outstanding in the world. Okay, so why did I just spend the last three minutes explaining all these six reasons above? Because keeping all these reasons fresh in your memory will help inspire you to overcome obstacles. Remembering these six reasons will give you the strength and energy to rise up and face challenges when times get tough down the road. So let me share the next slide. So remember, best does not mean easy. It is important to remember that some of the best and most rewarding things in life are challenging to achieve. Just because the US has the best higher education system does not mean that earning your degree will be easy. Remember that successfully overcoming obstacles is what brings out the best in you. So what are the most common obstacles international students may need to overcome? Well, I'm sure that Sarah and Mohammed will be discussing these things in greater detail later in our program. So for now, I will just name a few very, very quickly. So common obstacles, social integration, culture shock, language barrier, homesickness, uh, and high, heightened stress and anxiety. Remember, this is common for all international students in all countries. So I don't mean to scare you away. Uh, this is not a very fun list of things. It's certainly not easy to think critically about the potential challenges and what might uh, do to overcome them. In fact, it can often be scary to think about such things, or you may even feel embarrassed to talk openly about your potential problems or weaknesses. So a few uh, advice. Uh, let's look at some of the ways you can approach those ob obstacles. Realistic expectations means being prepared. So here's a question. 
Would you rather be faced with a problem that comes as a total surprise or be faced with a problem that you have already prepared a few good solutions and strategies? Obviously, it's always best to be prepared. A realistic expectation that means preventive care physically and mentally. The act of being prepared goes hand in hand with maintaining good health and well-being. If you are well prepared for future challenges, then, cho- then those uh, challenges are going to be more manageable and ultimately be much easier for you to overcome. In terms of student health and wellness, this is something we refer to as preventive care. Student success is bigger than academic success. Mainly, uh, many international students think that being prepared strictly refers to academic performance in the classroom. But in fact, academic success is only one part of a large picture. When we talk about student health and wellness, we're always talking about the larger picture, picture, not just part of the picture. And find your balance and keep your balance. Um, On the one hand, having realistic expectations means you cannot ignore potential challenges. But at the same time, you also cannot overthink or worry too much about potential challenges. In this sense, achieving overall student success requires finding the right balance between those two ends. One excellent strategy to help with achieving uh, balance is to break down, break large tasks down into smaller, clearer, and more manageable tasks. So remember, you are not alone. The support networks for international students are robust and abundant. So on that note, I'd like to end by mentioning a few more uh, good strategies and resources. So US colleges and universities all maintain healthy community and support networks. So just remember there's always someone or some place that you can go for help and support. When studying in the United States, you are never alone. And search for resources and ask for help. When international students search for student support services, they're often amazed at how many things they can find. This is because in the United States, student health and wellness is often considered a strategic campus priority. So to conclude my remarks, I would like to quickly list here some of the different forms that international student support services can take. Information sharing. US institutions communicate very efficiently. They're excellent at using the latest technology, advanced online instruction systems, and tried and true orientation best practices. Interactive opportunities. Lots of meaningful dialogues and interaction on all levels from freshman students, uh, from freshman students all the way to university presidents. Such interaction naturally help enrich college communities and also has a positive impact that extends well beyond the university walls. So last but not least, support networks. From informal peer-to-peer support groups to designated student support personnel staff, campus-wide collaboration at US colleges and universities results in meaningful life-changing cross-cultural experiences. And that's really, that's what it's all about. So thank you very much, Robin. Thank you so much, Ken, for that excellent overview of the things that all international students should be aware of when it comes to maintaining their health and wellness. Okay, now that Ken has gotten us started with such a nice outline of why our topic is so important, I'd like to dig a little deeper. Sarah, Uh, putting you on the hot spot. I'm hoping that you might be able to help us define more specifically what the words student health and wellness actually mean. For example, one question that jumps immediately to my mind is that the words health and wellness uh, seem very similar. Uh, Why do we make the distinction between health on the one hand and wellness on the other? Is there uh, important differences or aspects that that international students should be aware of so that they understand uh, each of these two concepts? And I think it might uh, also help us if you could give our viewers some real world examples of how international students stay healthy at Kent State. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Ken, for that excellent overview. I'd love to go a little deeper in explaining exactly what we are referring to when we discuss student health and wellness. 
and why it's so important that international students today consider researching this when looking into different US universities. So we've got this term student health and wellness, and it sort of has two components to it. So we've got the health side, and that's referring to your physical, mental, and emotional health. Then on the other side, we have wellness. And this is that bigger idea that Ken was just explaining, this feeling of overall happiness, fulfillment, and engagement in your university experience. But these aren't typically the things that we're seeing on college students' checklist when looking into different schools, right? Instead, we know that students care a lot about academic rankings, about job placement rates, or perhaps research uh, opportunities afterwards. And if those are the things that are on your college checklist, then that's wonderful. But we also want you to start thinking about the various parts of a university that are there to help you grow fully and holistically as a student. And going to college is such an exciting time in your life, but we also want you to be aware that it's not without certain challenges. And so after this presentation today, we want you to be able to go back to your college search process with the appropriate toolkit to start thinking about the bigger, bigger picture of this idea with student health and wellness. So I'll get right into it, starting with the health side. So like I mentioned, that encompasses your physical, mental, and emotional health. Now, when we talk about physical health, some common issues that come up right away with international students coming to a new country, immersing themselves in a new language, could be issues with sleep, exercise, and nutrition. You know, you're studying a lot, you have this newfound independence, and you can stay up late and hang out with friends, but as a result, you're getting pretty tired, you're losing out on exercise, and you might not be eating as well as you should. So one really big resource that you can find at your university is the health center. So this is where you'll find doctors and nurses right on campus, and it's typically covered by your student health insurance. And you can turn to them for things like any physical illness that might come up, you know, maybe a cold from being really run down, or perhaps an injury from something that happened. And something really wonderful that's happened as a result of the last year is the fact that we're realizing these appointments don't necessarily have to be in person anymore. So perhaps if you're feeling really run down and ill and you really don't have the energy to go into the doctor's office to get some advice, you can make that appointment virtually now and chat with your doctor over the phone right from the comfort of your dorm room. So that's one really big benefit of this the last year is this move to virtual. And when it comes to exercise, I think something that you'll notice during your college search is that U.S. universities really pride themselves in their recreational centers. Um, you know, we've got excellent gyms, exercise equipment, basketball courts, tennis courts, all kinds of things to stay active. But another really huge benefit of this past year is that universities are focusing on ways to get students active aside from just going to the gym, oftentimes because we couldn't be in person to use the gym this past year. So maybe you'll find universities that have really fun virtual workout programs, you know, online yoga classes or weightlifting, or perhaps they're organizing runs and walks for their students outdoors so that there are ways for you to stay active, especially at a time when you're probably sitting at your desk taking classes online right now. So you need to find other ways to get physical and universities are coming up with some really fun ways to make that happen. And then on the physical side, you also have your nutrition. And as I mentioned, you might be getting really busy with friends or staying up late studying and you're not getting the right nutrition um, through good hearty meals. But rest assured that US dining services really take this seriously. And now you can find across the United States dining services with food options that consider allergies, dietary restrictions, and religious practices as well. So if you're not finding the time to get to the grocery store or cook yourselves these healthy meals, rest assured that you can head out to a dining hall on campus, grab yourself a quick meal, and it's going to be healthy and nutritious. Now, still staying with the health side of things, you have your mental and emotional health that comes into play. And this is really, really important as an international student because there will be a lot of things affecting this side of you, whether that's classes, new relationships, perhaps romantic relationships, 
And so you may have a struggle perhaps processing information in the classroom or expressing certain emotions that you're feeling. And this is where counseling and psychological services will come into play at your university. And we're going to hear from Mohammed in a little bit more detail about that. But we want you to know that it's nothing to be embarrassed about to seek help for mental support. Um, it's not uncommon at all for international students and domestic students to experience stress, anxiety, loneliness, or perhaps issues with self-confidence. So we just want to highlight that campuses are built to assist you with this now with their counseling and psychological services. Uh, you might also be experiencing stresses related to academics. So go ahead and check out how your university handles academic advising, whether you're assigned an advisor in your program or if it's university-wide, if they have a writing center for you or a student success center. Those are all going to help your mental and emotional well-being as well. And I think something really cool that we've started at Kent State um, is online meditation classes. So, you know, again, that started as a result of the pandemic, but I think it's something that will keep moving forward because it's been so popular for students needing to just unplug from all their online stuff and take 30 minutes or so with an instructor to go through some stress relieving techniques. So I think that's another really big thing that's important for your mental and emotional health. Now on the wellness side of student health and wellness, again, this is a big picture idea talking about your overall happiness, engagement, and fulfillment in your college experience. And I wanna highlight that this is really where work-life balance comes into play. So we know that you are seeking an amazing academic experience. You might be really focused on a high GPA and being a super successful student, but the main point of going to university is developing you holistically. So start thinking about the things that you can do outside of the classroom. And this really develops that idea of overall wellness. And so some places you can look for that would be right off the bat, your orientation. How is your school going to get you acclimated to the campus life before you even get there? Again, oftentimes these are now virtual events. So they're probably thinking of fun ways to introduce you to new students or to show you clubs and organizations that they have on campus. Also ask about you know, community service opportunities or internships and student leadership opportunities. These are all the things that are going to help you develop outside of the classroom, all right? So that you're not just thinking about your GPA, but who you are as a person and what makes you passionate. And not only are these going to help you grow holistically, but they're excellent ways to meet new friends right off the bat. And again, if these are happening virtually, that's totally okay. You're still meeting friends online. You can text with them, email them, whatever it may be. So you're still making those relationships. And I'd like to just highlight some of the ways that Kent State is now using this idea of student wellness for our international students. So Hopefully my slides are visible to you all. Um, and I'll just mention really quickly, Mohammed will be talking about our counseling services, but we have an excellent center on campus that focuses on assisting our international students with mental health concerns. They're trained in working with you. Uh, they realize you may be coming from a background where it's uncommon to seek help for mental health issues, or you may be feeling a little embarrassed. But a benefit of this last year is that this is all happening virtually right now. So if you are feeling a little uneasy, you can actually just do this from the comfort of your dorm room in a video chat like we're doing now or maybe over the phone. And so they're there to help you with all these things from stress to self-confidence. I mentioned the rec centers that universities pride themselves on and we have a wonderful rec center at Kent State but I think what they're really highlighting is all the activities that we can do outside of that actual building at a time when we're maybe needing to stay distanced. Um, so we've got a bike share program. You can rent bikes and get that physical activity in that I was talking about earlier, whether it's going through one of the parks on campus or one of the trails that we have in the surrounding area. Um, we're organizing runs and walks outside that you can participate in at a distance and also those online meditation and yoga classes that I discussed as well. So you can do all of this right from your dorm room. And a couple of things um, 
that bring us together in community that I think is so important for that overall feeling of wellness. Um, well, first of all, we have over 400 student organizations. So you can always find community that way. But I'd like to highlight some of the things we've done this year, starting with our Friday foreign film series. And I think this was a really creative idea to not only have students learn about new cultures through an international film each Friday, but come together in community and chat about it afterwards. Again, watching this from your own bed, but then coming together virtually and discussing the film afterwards. Another way we showed our support for international students this past year and a way to come together was our staycation care packages and carry out lunches. So we find a nice spot outside to meet up with our international students you know, catch up with them, see what they've been doing the last year. And then we've got a goodie bag and a nice meal to give them. So we're keeping that nutrition in mind. And then that idea of wellness and just showing that we really care and we're there to support our students. And then finally, I will mention our Kent State of Wellbeing program. As Ken mentioned, this idea of wellness is a strategic initiative for a lot of universities, including Kent State where I work. And so this program, solely is for the purpose of finding new, innovative and creative ways to keep our employees, faculty, and most of all, our students healthy and well. And that's through some of those programs, like I mentioned with meditating, yoga classes, a healthy minds survey, and really to maintain this idea of health and wellness at Kent State. So if you have any questions about this afterwards, feel free to ask, and I can't wait to hear from all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was so extremely helpful for our viewers, uh, especially the way you clearly distinguish between health and wellness. Uh, I struggle with dietary restrictions myself, so I know what a challenge it can be, and it's wonderful to see all the support that is out there for that at U.S. colleges and universities. Um, and on the wellness side, terrific examples of how to socialize in all different kinds of ways and, and, and safely as well if, if we need to keep social distance. So thank you so much. Uh, and Mohammed, now I would like to turn to you. I know many of our viewers are eager to hear directly from an international student, especially one like you, who in addition to completing your undergraduate degree in the US, will soon be adding a US graduate degree to your resume. Congratulations on that. Uh, you must have gained a lot of valuable experience from all those years of hard work. Can you tell us a bit about your background and what uh, so many years of studying in the United States has taught you about student health and wellness? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Robin, for having me today. It's a, it's a pleasure working with you. And uh, hello, everyone uh, who are watching us from all around the world. Um, and thank you, Sarah and Ken, for presenting uh, some cool stuff. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my own perspective. Now, I, my name is Mohammed al Maki, and I go by Mo here. Um, in four days, I'm going to be getting my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. So uh, I'm ready to graduate. And um, I also want to share, you know, some of my experiences coming to the United States. Now, before I start to talk about that, let's just go a little bit behind and start from the beginning. So when I was in Saudi, um, I had a dream when I was 12 years old to become a doctor, a doctor in something in the mental health field. And because of the stigma around mental health, I didn't really know a lot about psychology and anything that's going on in that kind of field. So my dream was to come to the United States, get the best education when it comes to mental health, and hopefully go back to Saudi and implement the positive changes from what I've learned. Um, one thing that I faced when I first started was this idea of culture shock. So what is culture shock? Culture shock is these different emotions, different feelings that people get when they come from one culture and they are immersed in this different culture. And what I mean by that is that I come from a collectivistic culture, which means that we value group needs over um, individuals' goals. And I'm coming to a culture that's called individualistic, which focuses on the individual. So what does the person want to accomplish, what's their goals and how they want to achieve that and less about the community. And I remember the time when I first got here and um, the issue with like uh, body language and communication. So in Saudi, 
usually for men, it's, it's common that they look down when they're talking to the opposite sex. And when I came here, that's what I started to do. But some of my friends said, Mohammed, that's kind of disrespectful because you're not giving me your full attention. You're not giving me eye contact. And so I had to learn really quickly and had to adapt. And, um, and that's, that's a way for me to kind of fit in. And just to kind of give you a little bit of comparison between both cultures. Now, when it comes to a collectivistic culture, you know, we focus on the harmony with others, relationship with the group, uh, for working in groups. Whereas in the, the vagistic culture, it's more about independence, uh, it's unique in values, uh, prefers to work alone. So these are just some of the comparisons between those two. So the question is, how did I overcome uh, culture shock? Well, and, and here's a tip for me, or a bunch of tips uh, of the stuff that I've learned. Um, overcoming culture shock, in, involves engaging with people from the US to learn more about like their language, their behavior, their attitude and customs and all that stuff. So I'm gonna be sharing five different things. Number one, when it comes to language. Um, so when I got to the States at first, I wanted to get some English courses. One thing that I've done was to talk to all of the Arab community like, hey guys, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I'm gonna be speaking in English only. And the reason behind that is that I want to uh, better myself in English so that I can fit in easily to this dominant culture. You're gonna get a lot of support. People would appreciate that. Now, if there are people who say like, no, we don't support that idea. Hey, you can only control what you have control over. You can control your thoughts, uh, your attitude, but you don't have control over what other people would think or do. So that's when it comes to language. Number two, attending social events. Be on the lookout for any posters um, and any brochures that said like, hey, on this day, we're going to have this kind of event. And try to attend those events when you are inv invited by your friend to go to their family members uh, for like special holiday events, such as the 4th of July or Thanksgiving. I do not know what was Thanksgiving, what's the 4th of July, because it's just not something that we do in Saudi. And I had to learn that by attending these types of events. One cool thing about these social events is that free food. You can always get free food and who does not want free food, right? So attending social events is a great way to learn about the culture and its customs and its food and all that good stuff. Number three is organizations. I'm a busy guy and I'm sure that all of you guys are gonna be busy. You got schoolwork, you got work, and do we have time to uh, be a members of different organizations. Well, I need that social life. And the reason why I need that social life is to avoid something that's called burnout. The idea of burnout is a psychological um, issue uh, or psych psychological state that people get to experience because they overwork themselves. And that leads to uh, lack of motivation to do anything. All what you wanna do is just rest and do nothing because you've overworked yourself. So how do we avoid burnout? usually by doing self-care, self-care practices and being social and attending these organizations is one great way to kind of uh, work on self-care. Um, and I'm actually a member of nine different organizations. Now I do come from Kent State and Sarah shared with you guys like a lot of different things that, uh, that's going on on Kent State. And we have more than 400 organizations. I'm a member of just nine of them. And I think that's, that's a lot. One of those membership uh, organizations is the Saudi Student Association. And that's a great way for me to feel like home, away from home, because I can be with Saudi students or people from the same culture, same country, and we can kind of gather around and I feel like, you know, I have people here, I have family. Uh, if you are religious, there are also different organizations that focus on different religions. Um, so that's kind of one great thing about these organizations. So I talked about language, I talked about attending social events, and I talked about organizations. Fourth would be support. Now, I know it is hard for us to accept help, and especially, you know, in, in some, some cultures. It's really hard to accept help because that would make you look weak. I understand this because I have experienced it myself. However, put that behind your back because at the end, we are not Superman. Like we can only handle so much, right? We can't really do more than what our body and our minds could do. Um, so always seek support. If, you know, if it takes you 19 hours or 13 hours to work on a paper, 
go to the writing commons and get some support so that you can finish your paperwork in, in nine or seven hours. And you can spend the rest of the time working on other projects or for leisure activity and just kind of relax. There are other uh, services too that are provided uh, on campuses, such as tutoring centers. Like if you need help with physics or chemistry, instead of you having to deal with it alone, there are these places for you. The Career Center is a place for you to help you um, work on your resume or do some uh, practices of interviewing before you actually get to the job field. So these are some of the stuff that you can get for support. Fifth is my expertise, counseling. Why do we seek counseling? Well, think about the time when you had to close the doors, lock the windows, and be in the dark because you feel ashamed of something that you've done or feel ashamed of something that you're about to do. Think about the time when you've had issues with your family or relationship issues. Think about the time where you feel down, depressed, anxious, unsure about what you want to do in the future. All of these stuff that you don't feel comfortable sharing with anyone, counseling is there for you. Um, when it comes to stigma, you know, you might think that counseling is only necessary for those who have severe mental illness. Uh, and that's not the reality, right? And some people also think that, you know, I deserve to feel this way or I'm being punished. And that, that's why I feel the way I feel. That's fine. You know, if, if that's how you feel, that's okay. Nobody's going to say no. However, that should not stop you from seeking services and getting assistance. Counseling is again there for you. So you think about the benefits of counseling. So why do I do counseling? Well, counseling and counselors, again, are there to support you, especially you international students. Um, it helps you go and work over things that you've had issues with when it comes to your thoughts or your emotions. It provides you with skills and things to help you cope with what you're feeling. Um, it can also um, uh, uh, help you kind of process unresolved issues since your childhood when it comes to trauma. Again, that's also a great way to, um, you know, seek counseling for. And when it comes to professions, for us counselor trainees or counselors in the saying, we are trained to listen. We do not judge people. We do not have, um, you know, any kind of different thoughts when it comes to like different culture. We are actually trained to be culturally sensitive. We are trained to be open-minded. Uh, provide you with guidance if, if needed to be, uh, help you organize your thoughts, and uh, also get you to become aware of things that you probably have not thought about. Maybe your friends have been telling you like, hey, I feel like you are angry all the time and you don't notice it. We can help you realize that, hey, maybe we do have anger issues. Let's work on that together. And the beauty of counseling is that, again, you'll never be judged. You're never going to be looked upon differently. Um, and it's more importantly that it's not going to be shared with your family members, your tribe, or your community. It's not going to be shared with your professors, teachers, advisors, because it is highly confidential. And what I mean by that is that everything you're going to be sharing in session is just going to be between you and your counselor. No one else is going to know about that session. It's pretty important that I mention that because that is one reason why a lot of people don't seek counseling services. And no one would like to actually lose their license because people could lose their license if they, you know, breach confidentiality. And so nobody does that in the United States because everybody wanna keep their license. So they make sure that they keep your information highly secured and highly private. And you know what's the one most wonderful thing about counseling? It's offered for international students for free, free of charge in almost all the universities. Um, and most of these universities or the counseling centers are provided by licensed counselor trainees, such as myself. Now, if you don't prefer to go to a counselor trainee and prefer to go to a professional, that's where you can go to the university's health center and uh, you'll find people who are already trained and are doing their, their things for, for quite some time. Uh, and that would require some fees. Uh, and it all depends on like what kind of insurance that you have. So again, seeking counseling, getting organizations, attending social events, uh, doing some self-care, right? Uh, working on your language. All of these are ways to help you overcome culture shock so that you can have a better well-being. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mohammed, for that fantastic information, especially for helping to clarify for us what counseling is all about. 
Uh, so for all the prospective students out there, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, remember that despite common misconceptions, seeking the help of a professional counselor in the US is not a very complicated process. Uh, and in fact, many American students seek professional counseling on a regular basis for a variety of reasons. So it's something that we encourage all students to learn more about. Uh, and so with that, I would like uh, now to open the floor for your questions. There's a lot of questions coming through, so we want to make sure that we have uh, time to address them. Uh, but before we do that, I want to remind you that um, today's interactive Facebook Live episode is focused on helping prospective international students learn more about key concepts, resources, tips, strategies, specifically related to our topic of student health and wellness. We are, however, certainly aware that many of you out there have a myriad of other questions on different topics about studying in the United States, especially given all the challenges that we've been facing. So if we're not able to address your question today uh, during today's live discussion, please remember you can always reach out to an Education USA Center near you uh, uh, in your home country, as well as the admissions offices at the schools you're applying to for the latest information regarding timelines, policies, or any other questions you may have. Okay, let's get to your questions. Uh, so the first one that I'm seeing here is open to all speakers uh, to jump in and help us understand. Uh, this is a good one. What do I do or, or what should I do if I'm the only person from my home country, culture, or region that is currently studying at my school? And I'll op open the floor to anyone who wants to, to jump in and take that one. I can start. Um, Great. Thank you, Sarah. Without having been an international student myself, I'm sure Ken and Mohammed have a lot to offer about this. But first of all, I would just say welcome. And you are really brave for doing that and putting yourself out there. But the school is really excited to welcome you as well. And it's really exciting to meet people from places that they've never been. So chances are people are gonna get really excited when you say where you're coming from. And that might be a great icebreaker to meet new friends just by saying where you're coming from. But if you are feeling a little bit isolated, again, because you can't find that community of students from your home country, at Kent State, turn to the Office of Global Education or wherever university you're choosing, they'll have an office specifically for international students and they're there to support you once you're actually a student on campus. So there will be advisors that you can turn to and they'll either be able to direct you to students from maybe similar backgrounds or just invite you to various events to start making friends. But that would be my biggest tip is to just right away, go to your international office and see what support services that they can offer you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And any other thoughts? Uh, thank you, Sarah. And just um, after you that, uh, I think this is the beauty of uh, being an international student is to, full be, to fully emerge in another culture. And uh, especially, especially international students tend to uh, stick around with their own, own co-nationals. So if you're the only one from your region, your area, uh, so, you know, just, em just embrace yourself, emerge into the whole culture. And then I would recommend develop uh, a hobby, uh, you know, and realize your passion. And uh, so join all the on-campus clubs and uh, show your skills or find like-minded people. Uh, another one would be uh, um, be involved in community services, volunteer, uh, experiential learning. So this way, you'll be able to find a lot of like-minded people, uh, people with giving spirits, and also people who are very curious about uh, others that are very different from them. Thank you both, Sarah and Ken. Uh, that was great advice. Uh, the next question that we have is for you, Mohammed. Uh, which is, my family is not comfortable and may be embarrassed to talk openly about anything related to mental health. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for how I could start to have this conversation with them? You know, it might be hard depending on where, what culture you come from. Um, it is important to tell your family how you're actually feeling, what you're going through and mention that, hey, you know, just like if I'm having stomach ache that I have to go and seek, um, Stuff a doctor, if I'm feeling down or depressed, I still need to talk to a professional. And if it helps them to come with you in session, 
you can totally do that. And people are going to welcome you. Council trainees are going to welcome you. Um, you know, they might just have to do some, you know, paperwork and stuff like that. But then if that's going to make them feel comfortable, then that's good. And then after the first, you know, couple of sessions, that's the time when they'll probably tell the family member like, hey, you know, I appreciate you being here and supporting your, my client. Um, maybe it would be better if it was just going to be like a one time, um, like one on one counseling sessions between me and the client. And they'll support that and they'll appreciate that. And they'll actually see, you know, that it's, it's all kind of a stigma and it's not how people perceive it. That's a great answer. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, the next question we have is for Sarah or Ken. How can I meet students that might have the same fears as me? Uh, will I be housed in the same dorm, for example? Uh, well, since Sarah go first, uh, went first last time, I, I'll, I'll take the uh, lead this time. I, uh, I used to work in the housing department and it's really based on the, uh, your own housing's preference, how they would uh, assign uh, rooms for you. And I, I understand that many campuses has uh, decided to uh, intentionally not putting international students uh, with a uh, roommate with an uh, international student from the same country. And also some campuses are uh, tend to put international student in the same room uh, that is not a domestic student. So it's really up to different campuses and there's pros and cons for uh, both sides. I, I, would, I would say, regardless of the outcome and stay close to your resident assistant on your floor uh, and your student leaders. And if there's any conflicts arise, if there's uh, issues arise, uh, the university will provide conflict uh, mediation and also mentoring and uh, just be out on your floor, be social. And that's the key thing. So you're here, you're not meant to be alone in your room, uh, socialize and, you know, and eventually people will get to know you, you will get to know the community. Great, thank you so much, Ken. Um, so we've got quite a few more questions here. I wanna jump down to one uh, that I know many folks may be thinking of, which is, will showing, and this is for you, Sarah, will showing that I understand the importance of student health and wellness help my application? That's a great question. So I'll first answer specifically for Kent State. If you're Applying at the undergraduate level, we actually don't have an essay component. So you aren't necessarily required to demonstrate that you have that knowledge, but it will be really helpful once you actually get here and start to acclimate. But for other universities that do have an essay component um, for their admissions, again, it's not necessary to highlight that you understand the importance of student health and wellness. It's by no means a requirement, but it certainly wouldn't help to recognize that as an incoming international student, you're aware of certain challenges that may arise and that you're excited and you're ready to take on those challenges. I think that would be a really good way of phrasing it and that you also have um, sort of this emotional intelligence that might be something that you start hearing as a college student and that you're ready, willing and able to learn about it even more as a university student so that you're interacting in healthy ways with other students. That's great. Um, okay, a follow-up question, uh, which is, this is another great one for Ken or Sarah or, or Muhammad, anyone please jump in. What are some specific things I can do if my problems are because of low or poor English language ability? So a student that may be getting, feeling a lot of stress and anxiety um, because of their, their English language ability, what are some things that they can do? Anyone wants to jump in or I'll... Oh, Ken, you, you go. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you, Sarah. So um, I'd like to get it started. I think many campuses uh, would have uh, English language program and uh, that uh, they might have uh, language buddies and uh, uh, just geared towards the student who have very low English uh, background. And, and also uh, another thing to really opened up to me with other people is uh, um, to, uh, to volunteer at uh, the, um, the classes offer your language. For example, uh, Mandarin Chinese. And if you, ca uh, you can talk to the professor and you say, hey, I'm happy to uh, 
uh, interact with uh, your student that is uh, that want to study about Chinese or uh, uh, other languages. And I'm happy to be a language partner. So in this way that you can interact with people who are interested in your culture, interested in your language, as well as you can uh, have a ex language exchange. Great. Um, so now I'd like to jump uh, to Sarah or Mohammed for the next question, which I'm sure a lot of our viewers are, are thinking about, which is do student health insurance plans typically cover mental health services? If not, will I have to pay for counseling or mental health services? Okay, I can speak a little bit about that. Great, so thanks. when it comes to the counseling centers, usually it's free of charge for faculty members, students, people in the community, and pretty much all the universities. Uh, when it comes to the health center, that's gonna be the different scenario. Uh, that's when you're gonna be paying some fees depending on the type of insurance that you have. Uh, most, you know, most universities would require students to have um, health insurance. And some people would have like a 20 bucks copay. Some people don't actually pay any copays. Uh, and usually, or most health insurances that I'm aware of actually cover mental health. And maybe Sarah could also speak on right. anything that she knows. Yeah. Sure, yeah, it, it's typically covered like Mohammed said. And if you're ever unsure if it is, you can um, usually reach out to your health center and inquire and they'll know what international health insurance covers. So always check with them if you're a little worried that you are going to have to pay something. You can check ahead of time. Thank you, Mohammed and Sarah. I know that uh, probably alleviates a lot of questions and anxiety around, these are great services, but how do I pay for them? So thank you so much. Um, all right, we're getting close to time, but there's a couple, there's two final questions I wanna get in here. Um, that are, that are really important. And the first is uh, a student writes in, I'm, I'm shy, what can I do to get involved in ways that don't feel overwhelming to me? If, Ken or Muhammad, if you could speak to that. Okay, I can go through. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the um, Counseling centers are offered there for free. So you can definitely reach out to the counseling center and talk to a professional to work on anything that you need to work on. So if you are feeling shy because you have social anxiety and it's just difficult for you to stand up in front of people or be in a crowd, counseling could help you a lot um, kind of work on that and give you skills and coping things to, to work on these issues. Um, other than that, trying to also communicate with some people in your class, um, you know, just interacting with your friends or your peers. And you can do a lot of these stuff virtually. And I think most of the classes nowadays you are offered virtually. So you don't, have, you don't actually have to be there face to face with the other person and feel kind of very anxious. Mm -hmm. Ken, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I'd like to uh, recommend about three things. Um, I, I understand sometimes it can be even difficult just walk into the dining room whereas everyone else is different. You don't know anyone. You know, I've been there and that is totally fine. You will be fine. So one thing to do that, um, to, to overcome that is to find an on-campus job. Uh, you can see my message. You don't have to talk to people. You can just do things with people and together to, to develop that camaraderie. So uh, having an on-campus job, not only you will have an income, but also you get to meet with a lot of people day in and day out and you work together, they'll develop a very strong relationship. Second is uh, if you can see if there's any outdoor adventure activities, then you can go on trips, you know, talk at the fireside, by the fireside, you know, camping with people, everyone lay on the ground, you know, you know, no one's higher than another, everyone's the same, looking for food, sleeping in a tent, uh, hiking together. Uh, That's a great way to build community. And the, um, another one, as I mentioned, is volunteer services, you know, to join in people who with uh, giving spirits, you know, to, to do something meaningful together. Uh, I think this, you don't have to uh, talk, you can just do things with people. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to move to our uh, final question, and I'll ask folks to, to weigh in. This is, this is for the panel. Um, really quickly, uh, with your response, because we're going to transition to 
uh, our 10 takeaways that all of you will be giving our audience. We want to make sure that we get to go get to those before the end of the hour. So the question is about um, culture shock. What are some things I can do to prepare now before arriving in the United States to help limit the possible effects of culture shock? Uh, if either, if, if if each of you could just chime in with a with a quick suggestion, that would be that would be great. Practice mindfulness. That's one great way to kind of help you with any kind of anxiety kind of situation, um, and that could be just kind of focusing on your breathing. You know, remember the number four, the roll four four in from your nose and then four pause and then from out from your mouth and trying to do that and just kind of be mindful and be there in that state without having to worry about what's going on that helps you especially if you are in anxiety provoking situation and if you just don't know what to do great thank you mohammed i'd like to add with uh, uh teaming up with your parents or family members that uh before going abroad you know, have a clear understanding together with your families uh, to understand what it's like. And if there's any issues and scenarios, for example, I have a conflict with the peers, what should I do? You know, come up with strategies ahead of time, especially with, uh, with parents, family members support. So when, when things come, you know, you will know where to go to, who are your support network. And at least you have your family member that support you to encourage you to go to counseling center, to meet with uh, professional student fair staff. Great, thank you, Ken. I'm gonna stop it right there. Thanks all of you. And we're gonna now quickly switch um, to ask each of you to briefly share a few final thoughts, helpful tips or reminders about student health and wellness uh, with our audience. If we could go through those. Uh, Ken, let's start with you. Well, it's my honor. So remember your goals to stay positive and stay motivated. Uh, remembering what makes U.S. colleges and universities the best in the world and feeling inspired by your choice to study in the United States. These things will help give you the best attitude for maintaining health and wellness. Uh, remember the importance of maintaining realistic expectations. This means remaining prepared, be open and honest with yourself about potential challenges. In the end, this will make the challenges much easier to overcome. And finally, always remember that you are not alone. As an international student in the United States, your college's thriving communities, along with the many support services provided are always available to you. The services eagerly await your visit. So do not hesitate to reach out, ask for help and connect with others. Thank you so much, Ken. And Sarah, over to you. Yes, so I just want to say that now you are ready to add this idea of health and wellness to your college checklist. So remember that going forward when you go back to researching universities, you're looking for a place that is the best fit for you. And the best way for you to make that decision is to keep your health and wellness in mind. And then secondly, ask if you can speak to current international students. Um, you know, we counselors were here to guide you along this decision, but who better to ask for advice than an international student who has been in your shoes before? It's a great way to get advice and it's a great way to make a friend right off the bat before you even get to campus. And I just wanna quickly say, I spoke to two alumni from Kent State this past week who just so happened in our conversation to bring up health and wellness and how important that was to them during their university experience. So it was just really cool to see that this is real advice that you can take and utilize in your future as a college student. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And now finally over to you, Mohammed. Well, to remember this phase, remember Mo's care strategy. C for connect, connect with people, socialize, interact with others, be open to experiencing new experiences, adapt and learn, be flexible, uh, welcome people's comments if they gave you comments and that's a great way for personal growth. R for relax, relax and chill, do some self-care activities. That could be watching a movie, going out for walks, sleep, right? We need that, our body and our mind need that. And finally, E for enjoy every moment in your life and try to be mindful when you do enjoy the things that you like to do. That would make it even more valuable and uh, more meaningful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mohammed. That's terrific, it's a terrific strategy. 
Okay, that brings us to the end of our program today. I would like to thank our guests, Ken, Sarah, and Mohammed again for taking the time to be with us and for sharing their insights and experiences. I also want to thank all of you out there for watching and participating. We hope that you found this program useful. And finally, I would like to give a special Education USA shout out to some of the students tuning in from around the world who submitted photos to let us know they are watching today from home. So looking for a photo here. Uh, wonderful, I'm seeing from Education USA Chile that we have the entire undergraduate college club with us today. Look at those acceptant letters, well done. All right, and let's see. Now from neighboring Uruguay, I'd like to give a shout out to the four Education USA Opportunity Fund scholars who are watching today. Hello to Abby, Emiliano, Julieta, and Angela. Thanks so much for joining us today. All right, let's see now from Africa in Kenya. We have another group of four Education USA scholars with us today. Hello, Eric, Yashvi, Mark, and Jane. Love those photos. Thanks for sharing them with us today. Okay, and now it looks like we have time for one last EdUSA shout out to Jeremias an Education USA Opportunity Fund student from Paraguay who will be attending Trinity College this fall. Thanks for watching our program today, Jeremias. We wish you all the best. Keep following your dreams. And I know there are so many more. Thank you all for joining us today. It's great to see you all virtually. And as always, for more information about studying in the United States, please visit the Education USA website at www.educationusa.state.gov. Some of the resources there include an overview of our five steps to US study, as well as information about how to locate the nearest Education USA Center in your home country, connect with us via social media, learn about upcoming events, research scholarships and financial aid opportunities, and much, much more. Be sure to join us here again for future Education USA interactive Facebook live programs. This is Robin Lathrop, wishing you every success in finding your best fit for study in the United States.